Okay. Everybody hear me okay? Thanks a lot. Um, let me start by thanking the organizers also. And uh, uh, I guess I'm the last speaker before the panel. So, um, you know, try to uh, keep you engaged. I want to uh, say that this is a little bit out of my normal venue. I, I certainly have enjoyed um, experimenting in the classroom, and I'll tell you about uh, some of the experiments we've done today. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't consider myself really in the, the league of um, sort of a, a, a chemical educator uh, of the kind that you are. I, in the kind that, you know, tradition started showing up in the classroom and then realizing some problems and thought about some changes and, and, uh, and, and have learned a lot along the way. So you can help me learn it um, as well. So today I'm going to tell you about the courses that we teach, first of all. Um, these are organic courses, uh, sophomore organic courses for non-chemistry -chem majors. Uh, how we went about replacing the lecture, the traditional 50-minute lecture, with um, sort of the flipped classroom idea, but really uh, focusing on problem-based uh, solutions. And we began that in 2008. I didn't hear the term flipped classroom until about 2009 or 10. So um, uh, it was clearly things that a lot of other people were thinking about, too. Uh, I think one of the things we've learned is that, you know, um, education is an, and learning is, is an individual accomplishment. And, and so the more we can take a kilo student classroom and break it down to the individual, um, I think there's a lot to be gained. And I'll tell you about a peer-to-peer -peer tutoring uh, system that we've put in place that has helped, I think, uh, us get to that point. And then finally, I'll end with how we've taken this um, uh, format and been able to implement a semester-long group project. So uh, here's the nature of the, the beast. So we're dealing with um, Chem 232 and 332 at Illinois. These are um, organic chemistry courses for non-chemistry majors. The chemistry majors and the chemical engineers and the biochemists actually take a different track. And historically, it's been that way for um, I don't know. Uh, I think I read a, uh, actually a Journal of Chemical Education article from in the 1920s from uh, from Roger Adams that described this model. So it's really been around uh, at Illinois for a long time. But uh, uh, one of the key things, and it looks like my pointer's um, a little bit too dim, so is is really this point that I want to leave a good taste in their mouth. This is for many students. Um, the last opportunity they'll have to take a formal class in chemistry. Some will go on to take biochemistry, but um, for others, this really is the end. Um, there's a large contingency of life science majors, uh, a fair number of engineers. Many of these are bioengineers, uh, agriculture majors, um, math and physical science majors, and then we even have a few business and communication. Arts and humanities uh, show up as well as a small percentage of, um, of what's there. The challenges are it's a diverse pool of students, as you can see from their backgrounds. Um, we're dealing with a kilo student size uh, classroom, so we've got to deal with large numbers, and um, that always uh, brings on new challenges. Um, like we've heard throughout the sessions, make chemistry relevant. And the real key was you know, how to do more with less. Um, fewer TAs, uh, we're typically teaching uh, in the three lectures uh, a week format with uh, three TAs for maybe as many as 700 students. And they did um, spend most of their time grading. They had some office hours as well. Um, how do we keep that same number of students, uh, TAs to student ratio uh, the same and still uh, be able to deliver the class in a meaningful way? But this is really the main point I'm going to try to get across in a couple of subtle ways, uh, that really education is uh, not a mechanical process. It's a human process, and it's all about the people. And so how do we take uh, and center instruction on the individual learner in a kilo, uh, kilo student-sized classroom? Um, I won't spend any time on this, but you know we do have, and we start with learning goals and outcomes. Um, when I saw the grand challenges in science, uh, I was particularly struck by how many of those mapped onto the sort of things that what we strive to do in, in our class, and I reconfigured my own set of learning outcomes to sort of match that very nice. I think it was done at Stanford. Um, the only difference I added was really what's in the four squares around it, because everything we try to do is to uh, make sure that we're encouraging rigor, creativity, curiosity, and, and a sense of accomplishment. And that sense of accomplishment may be an individual accomplishment, or it may be a team accomplishment, uh, as in our semester-long group project. 
Uh, here's the basic uh, idea behind the class now, and so this is really the flipped classroom model, I think, is what you'll recognize it as with a few caveats. And um, one of the things, uh, before I dive in and tell you about the structure, that made this work was to go to online electronic homework, which for organic chemistry works out wonderfully with machine-read uh, computer uh, drawings and curved arrows and the whole uh, thing, um, the whole uh, basically uh, format that we would typically use with, and put uh, and pen with pencil and paper, um, we can do with machines and machines that can interpret um, those, uh, those gra that graphical language. So uh, there is no textbook. Uh, there are a set of notes. Uh, basically what students are asked to do is to uh, look at what used to be the lecture, now distilled down into about five five-minute webcasts. Uh, they come to a discussion section. This discussion section may be face-to-face -face in a room that has about 50 computers. Um, remember, we're dealing with this large number of students. So strategically, that's the largest classroom we have, 50, I think it holds actually about 55 students, um, that, that uh, uh, has to be strategically timed so that we know that we won't overfill that class. 8 a.m., if you absolutely need a face-to-face -face interaction with another human being during your discussion period, show up Monday, Wednesday, or Friday at 8, 8 a.m. Did I say 8 p.m.? 8 a.m. Is, is, is the key time. Um, We've never overflowed that class. We do have an overflow in case we need it, but, um, but we don't usually uh, have that problem. The um, other options are show up at noon and uh, online, plug in to where, uh, to where we are um, from wherever you are, and uh, you could do it from Washington, D.C. if you wanted to, or um, 5 p.m., those are also online. So typically in an online, so we'll, we'll get close to about 50 at 8 a.m., um, uh, showing up live face to face, and they're root, they're regulars. I mean, they are the the ones that set their alarm clock and show up. Um, but then at, at at noon and at 5 p.m., it's quite variable. It can be uh, 75 show up. It can be 150. It's um, and the students, by the way, are not dialed into one particular format. If they wanted to come 8 a.m. on Monday, but then on Wednesday they really didn't want to get up. Uh, because they had to study the night before late, uh, they could catch us at, at noon or they could catch us at, at five. Offering flexibility, I think, is, is one of the, um, the key things that we do here. Uh, mostly we spend our time, and I'll show you some examples, working problems of the day, we call them. And, and really that's all we do. We don't lecture to them. We just start to say, can you see the concept uh, that was discussed in the webcast uh, applied in this way? And again, we try to map it. Every problem we try to map onto those um, learning uh, goals and outcomes. Uh, at the end of the, the, the uh, discussion section, we offer what we call a P3. And again, because this is a machine-graded um, uh, problem, uh, we can put them in the exam setting and basically bathe them in the experience as frequently as we possibly can. And I think this has huge value because a lot of times I hear students say, Oh, that problem, you know, um, that you gave me as a practice for the exam wasn't nearly as difficult as any of the exam problems. And, and so I, I, I knew that, well, those were just old exam questions that we gave you anyway. Um, I think it was more of the experience of, you know, the pressure of the exam setting and the time constraints. So when five minutes comes, we ask them to solve a problem that they've never seen before, and they have five minutes to do it. And if you uh, successfully answer this question will give you some bonus points on the next exam, so there is some incentive for trying to do that. Um, and then what I haven't told you, but I'll save it for a little bit later on, is to tell you about uh, the peer-to-peer -peer tutoring experience. It's relatively early days still in this, and, and we're still experimenting with it, but we do have some encouraging results. So let's jump into really some uh, nitty-gritty of what does this actually look like. I won't show you the webcast. There's still. Phil's the TA. These are the students. And if they want to communicate, they can use a mic. Uh, they don't typically, I'll tell you that. We have some people who like feel comfortable using the mic, but a lot of students just chime in with the chat. We typically have two TAs manning one of these online discussion sections. One is basically answering questions nonstop, and the other one is facilitating the discussion. Here, Phil was doing all the talking. Sometimes we'll ask one of the students to show their desktop. 
By the way, in this particular, this was captured in the summer, I think, of 2008, so it's kind of old, but that summer we actually um, asked, there was a, a course in uh, Beijing, Peking University, being taught that was organic chemistry in English. And so if you see any of the PKU students, um, it was 8, I think it was 8 a.m., it might have been 9 a.m., I don't remember. Um, in, in, this was the summer, I believe, of, of 2008. It was, uh, um, you know, 8 a.m. In, in Champaign-Urbana, and it was um, like 9 p.m. On, uh, on, on, in, in Beijing. And that was true even on Friday night. We get a lot of participants. I mean, Friday morning in Champaign and Friday night in Beijing. They were, they were quite, uh, quite involved. But you can see with the tool, it's machine gradable. That kind of question could be, um, we could ask a student to show what they've accomplished and, and so on and so forth. All of these and what was in the title, uh, taking off the training wheels, is, is really this idea that well, I would really like you know, to make sure that I teach my students um, about failure and how to respond to that failure. And so in the kinds of problems we ask, um, we're not asking for a, a simple multiple choice answer. You'll see in a moment how those kinds of questions completely fail to hit the mark. But it's the typical solve this multi-step mechanism problem. Um, we don't do very much in this non-majors class of synthesis, but it could be a multi-step synthesis problem. The idea is that you know, they have a complex problem that's um, non-algorithmic, multifaceted, multi-step, and at least for the students, it's certainly unchartered territory for them, something they've usually never seen before. They've got to uh, use uh, their creative process to generate a variety of initial guess solutions. And we really then encourage them to, and this is what we do during discussion, you know, how can you get this problem solved, uh, started? What's the, what's the strategy to initiate it? Um, you've got multiple choices and how to begin. You've got to uh, progress each of these initial guesses through, advance them to hopefully a solution ultimately. So take a risk, which one is the best? Uh, choose and try to develop that through a multi-step process, uh, ultimately to a solution. At some point, are you getting closer to a solution? Um, maybe you don't know yet and you've got to advance further. Uh, maybe you uh, have to uh, encounter the failure. This is probably a bad initial first guess. I need to go back and try again. And, and so this is the element of really what we try to do in our discussion section with each and every problem and encourage them to, to, to realize that there is going to be failure along the way, but it's not the end of the world. You just need to rethink and start over again. So here's an example of a pressure point problem. Remember, this is what comes at the end of the, uh, the discussion section. This was on uh, sigmatropic rearrangements. You get to see from this video, this is real time, or maybe slightly sped up, but essentially it's um, the student dealing with the five minute clock trying to solve a problem that they've never seen before. This is a one five sigmatropic rearrangement involving an allene, and they honestly hardly have ever even seen the allenic functional group. And so you can see the student struggling right now. It's certainly the student is trying to figure out, you know, what is the intermediate, how do I get there that would lead me ultimately to the final product. Once they get that, learn how much more deliberate the arrow has become when they suddenly realize that they've found the solution to the problem. And with 20 seconds to go, the student hits submit, um, waiting for the machine to grade, and the answer in this case is correct. And Basically, uh, the reference from which this problem was taken is given. Um, you've never seen a 1-5 sigmatropic rearrangement with an allene before. You reasoned by analogy. It's a very powerful concept. And so that's essentially the P3 problems, which mimic very much the kinds of questions we ask on exam. How are the exams scored? Um, first of all, the students show up in an exam room. It's that computer exam room. They show their ID. It's all authenticated. People have to... Um, uh, you know, be who they are and uh, identify themselves with some form of ID. So um, we've caught cheaters, by the way. I won't go into that, but if you want to know, we can tell you about how we've uh, caught cheaters in some very interesting using electronic uh, means. Okay, so here's how we score the exam. No points unless the answer is fully correct. It's actually uh, very much similar to what um, Michael just said. And basically, uh, a machine-graded problem, partial credit would be possible if we knew every possible you know, reason to give partial credit ahead of time, but we really uh, decided that a, a more interesting way to assess them is to introduce this idea of diagnosis. Um, your answer is incorrect. You may either choose to go on to the next problem or continue and try and solve this one. 
if they continue, they lose a point for each ins incorrect submission that they, they make. Um, some questions have a residual point value. It's a very difficult question. It might go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. And basically, you're just expect and hope for that you will eventually work your way through and find a solution to the problem. Um, open notes, uh, open internet, open anything except uh, a friend. Uh, Non-friends also apply. So they can't basically use any electronic means of communication to another human being, but they can use any electronic means of, hum of communication to anything that you or I would use in trying to solve a problem. Um, then finally, uh, all questions, just like we heard yesterday, are new, um, never been seen before. We write every single exam uh, and put it into the uh, um, uh, machine and basically uh, um, uh, and the students are, are, are not expecting to see a, a problem that uh, is exactly like what they saw before. Here's an example of a poorly formatted question. Uh, this is very early days before we, we got rolling. Um, this is what I would say uh, is the, mat, the, the mouse, the rat, I guess, in, in the maze. So. Uh, here, basically, a student is trying to get some residual credit with a relatively uh, minimal amount of time. It's totally reduced to something of no intelligence whatsoever being applied. It is just random guessing, submitting, and failure, you know, repeatedly. Uh, and it's amazing how long they'll continue to try to do this if they think there's some chance that they'll get points. We don't write questions like this anymore. We go for the much more open-ended, uh, mechanistic kinds of, of questions. We do allow open internet, uh, and so here's a student who's resourceful. Actually, uh, we encourage them to use the scientific lit lit literature. We teach them how to use the scientific literature. Um, here's a student who pulled up the uh, article on which this problem was based. Now, this is great. If I can get my sophomore organic chemistry class to read and interpret organic chemistry, I think I've accomplished something that is you know, pretty significant. The next. Uh, uh, example is, if there's not reading going on here, I'm not sure what is, but it certainly looks like this particular student during the exam, 48 minutes left, um, was uh, reading a Jax article. Again, one, we might have even sent them to this particular article. And again, just because they can see the article doesn't mean they're going to solve the problem. Can they interpret the chemistry that's there and use that in a way that's helpful to solve that particular problem? Um, Mike Evans was a, a, a real blessing in that um, he was a, a graduate student and, and has really taken a lot of ownership on developing this class even beyond what I had envisioned. And he has a lot of skills that I don't have. I'll just show you what happens when you collect a lot of data. So what you're going to see is a plot that emerges during the exam on um, the, our, our basically interpretation of how the exam is going, how the students are doing. Each dot on this plot is going to rep, uh, represent a student. Um, there are questions 1 through 20. Um, the score of that individual is on this uh, graph here. And basically, the size of the bubble represents the number of submissions that they've made cumulative over the entire exam. And when bubbles grow, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, the people that are doing extremely well have very high scores and very small bubbles. And so those are the students that, you know, have, we'd like to emulate. I'm going to miss, I'm going to skip over this um, first one. But let me go to the, let me see if I can actually skip over this and uh, go to the next slide. So uh, the positive deviant is, you know, the student we'd like to see. Notice they go linearly through the exam where there's other people who are just, ran, you know, uh, trying to find a problem that they can actually do. But it's really um, quite interesting when, when your exam is all electronic, you can collect a lot of interesting data from mouse movements to uh, this sort of uh, big picture kind of idea. Let me move on to peer-to-peer -to -peer tutoring. Um, we realized through uh, uh, some of our assessments that one of the most important ways that students were learning was by, not by video, not by even the problems that they were doing, but by the interactions that they were having with other students. And so we set this up. Again, since we're using an electronic-based uh, format, what we would do is at the end of a, an exam, we were not satisfied maybe with the average score. We would give them a retake option. Again, it's machine graded, so it didn't require a TA to grade it. And what we would do is you know, if you answered the problem correctly, there would be a, a, a essentially a, a gate, an electronic gate, uh, that would put you into one of two categories. If you answered the question correctly, you were in the tutoring pool. 
if you really needed help and were ready to seek it, you could um, go enter into the 2T pool if you were incorrect. And there was a link that was available um, after you hit the submission button and depending upon what your outcome was. So this is basically a marketplace of available tutors and 2Ds that need those. Uh, they can grab a ticket, make contact with their tutor. It's a one-on-one -on -one way to interact. Um, at the end of all of this, assuming that everyone is successful, uh, if you want to earn credit for this, you need to do a, a video reflection of the uh, outcome of, of that tutoring experience. Both the tutor and the 2D need to do an individual reflection. Um, we don't monitor every single one of those videos, but we do kind of keep track of the clusters of people and the uh, information flow, uh, the uh, uh, diffusion of, of information. And so this is the kind of network of interactions that um, evolve. The larger the node, uh, basically the more central they are to, to the network and how much interaction that they've had with others. And so it becomes uh, key to sort of monitor the information, at least uh, sporadically through these video reflections about what's going on. And so um, I would like in the, the, the next um, slide to just let you listen to the language that one student is being you uh, is using in uh, in this video reflection. It takes a, a few moments. How, how much time do I have? Yeah. Okay. It's just it's really about two or three minutes long, but I think it's going to capture basic ideas. So basically, this was the, uh, um, uh, we, we do this uh, student assessment of learning gains, and you can argue whether that's a very good assessment or not. I'd say it has some value. Uh, you know, it's what the students are, are, are basically getting an idea of. And, and so, you know, one of the big surprises that came out of this was, you know, there is, compared to other things, and, yeah, with the error bars, you never know really um, how the certainty all plays out, but reasonably confident that, that there's some meaning there. Watching um, video lectures online was, uh, you know, not rated nearly as highly as uh, I think we had earlier phrased the question slightly different, working with your peers. And then we instituted this peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer tutoring and, and you know, that, that clearly um, had some value, at least it's as good as, if not better, 
than the other modes of interaction and learning that are going on in the class. Um, Semester-long group project, I have maybe just a, a second to tell you a little bit about this, but we implemented it. Uh, it's essentially, again, um, t uh, having the students take some uh, uh, literature that is relevant to the class. A lot of bioorganic chemistry ends up uh, showing up. And, and the students create, and I think that act of creating is great. I mean, they, they will basically tear apart maybe an, uh, an, an enzyme, uh, break it down into bonds and atoms, electron flow. Um, they'll do molecular orbital calculations. Again, we teach them uh, how to do all this thing, these things. And, and, and the whole idea is to promote these uh, professional scientific skills. Um, I think this is all based on these uh, student assessment of learning gains. Um, we've done a couple of experiments where we've had MOLDAC, which is our project, it stands for Molecular Mode of Action, um, on, uh, we've used it, and then we've had a couple of semesters like the spring of 2011, uh, summer and fall of 2011, where that project was removed and replaced with some additional lectures and an additional exam. And, and um, you know, there's a noticeable drop in the, uh, wh when the uh, project was not on, in things like um, working with others, uh, scientific writing, um, and then, you know, the, the critical reading is one of the other uh, bars that come in there. And so I, I think that, you know, um, there seems to be some value of these professional skills that's showing up. We have a lot of other things that uh, don't change, um, and so, you know, these were the things that, that did. Maybe they're not too surprising, and that's okay, but actually seeing some differences, uh, as we've learned, um, in, important and, and, and interesting. So just to summarize, I think we've successfully flipped the two-semester organic sequence. I haven't talked very much about the first semester. Uh, I mostly spent on, uh, on what we've done in the second semester, but we operate in a very similar way without the project at all in the first semester. It's a larger number of students. I can say that from a lot of data that we've collected, um, it's been done no harm. We basically haven't improved things um, uh, in terms of you know, these learning outcomes and objectives. But at the same time, we certainly, learning is robust, okay, that's, that's the bottom line. And uh, you have to work really hard to screw it up. I think that's, that's a, uh, to, to really noticeably screw it up. Um, that's, that's one of the, the, the main points. Um, uh, machine graded uh, homework discussion problems and these pressure point problems along with exam um, adds a lot of value, I think. And here's the key word is might, because we haven't really fully assessed it yet. But this test format, um, with real-time feedback, I think offers this ability to uh, ask your students to diagnose their own errors and eventually solve their problems, dealing with this failure, risk, um, and uh, um, uncertainty uh, issue. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, again, sort of a, a qualifier, seems important. Uh, uh, the student learning has been implemented in a way that's very sustainable. It hardly takes any effort whatsoever for us to put that into place. Um, and then. Uh, this idea of uh, gains in professional skills seems to be coming through from the semester-long group project. This is not sustainable. It's a huge amount of work. I, I enjoy doing it. It's my hobby, I say, basically, to the students. Um, but it either requires a super TA, TA like Mike Evans or uh, an intensely devoted instructor. I'll end with what question I posed, because I don't think we necessarily have any answers to this, but how to center instruction on the individual learner in a killer student classroom remains an unsolved uh, problem. And that's all I have. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you.